Good morning, and welcome, good and faithful servants. That's in, in some ritual that I know being called a good and faithful servant is what we, what we hope for at the end of our lives. My name is Daniel Gray, and this is our fourth in a row live service, I believe. And it would not surprise me that next week we don't have a service. I haven't talked to Jefferson, I haven't talked to anybody about this, but my reading of the newspapers, my reading of the, what's going on, the hospitals will be full in a few days. And and I, it would not surprise me that those of you coming to church next week might see a sign on the door. But bear with us, we'll have virtual. We will continue. Please join me in the call to worship. It's in your bulletin. Thank God at all times for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, give thanks to God. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything. We thank God when we can and as we can for struggles, for solitude, for fear. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God that in Christ our joy as well as in our pain, our losses as well as in our laughter are in God's heart. Dan. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dondria, and we are so happy you're here today. It's good to see all of you. Um, I'm the praise band leader here. Um, before we get started this morning, I'm sorry, my brain froze. It's the only thing freezing this week. So, <laughs> um, before we get started today, let's join together in our vision statement. Here at the heart of Beavers, Christ calls us to be our community, body, mind, and spirit. And like Dan said, I think there's so much uncertainty this week, but um, as we gather for worship, let us, let us bow our heads together and pray. Lord, as we gather in the beauty of this place, and in this worship service, it, no, no matter how we do it, online and in person, we come to pray, to worship, to receive healing and hope. We come from the struggles and the triumphs of this week, knowing we need to feel the presence of God. Be with us this day. This has been a, a, a rough week. Discomforting heat, smoke from the fires that we can't seem to prevent or control, and a virus that once again looks to send our lives on a different track. Calm us and soothe our souls. Allow us to rejoice that you've provided a special place where we may gather to talk of your presence and your love to sing your praises in some strange form and to be strengthened to go forth with hope. In your name we ask it. Amen.
see you again this morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Ann Welt Martin. I'm a retired Methodist pastor and member of this church. And uh, uh, Pastor Jefferson and his wife are on vacation, and he is actually um, giving her an anniversary. So, what she richly, all lives richly deserve anniversary celebrations. My husband's do too. And so that's where they are this morning, and I have the privilege and joy of working with you this morning. And then let's take some time now to lift up our joys and concerns to God in the privacy and the holiness of our own hearts. Lord, you are the great creative source without which our lives could never have begun. You are the friendly providence in whom our lives never end. Be now the energizing presence of our lives for all this interval between the miracle of our origin and the mystery of our destiny that we may claim your light to guide us, your strength to uphold us, and your love to unite us to each other here and now. But much more even than that, your love to unite us to all whom we love, wherever they may be. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
And amid all the political speeches, the parades, and the protests, and the posturing surrounding this issue, comes the quiet voice of one Native American who summed up his view on immigration for the Oregonian this way. I watch the Norwegian Americans and the English and German and Mexican Americans quarreling about who has the right to live on the land they stole from us in the first place. I submit to you that the power, energy, and emotion surrounding this issue comes from the head-on collision of two basic and fundamental human needs. First, the need to provide for yourself and your family food, shelter, education, survival, a way out of poverty and into a better life. That's a need that every human being, every one of us, will meet, however we need to do it. Legally, if we can. Illegally, if we can't. But we will meet that need. That reality runs head-on into the second fundamental human need the need for security, the need for safety, the need to control your environment so that it does not kill you. So we gather in families, in tribes and in clans, and ultimately in countries. And as countries, the need that any viable country has for safety, for security, is to be able to control its borders. A country that has no power to control its borders, has no power to control its destiny or the destiny of the people within it. How many people know what the Maginot Line was? Okay. For those of you who don't, the Maginot Line was a heavily fortified, impregnable line that France uh, constructed between itself and Germany after World War I. Everybody kind of knew everything wasn't settled. The French expected the Germans to come back. And they constructed this, this incredibly uh, armamental line between the two countries, the line that Germany, they knew Germany could not cross. So Germany didn't try. They just turned their <coughs> tanks north and west and rumbled through Belgium and hit France from the other side where they didn't have any protection. Belgium, as a country, had small, flat, defenseless, had no power to defend its borders or affect its destiny or the destiny of the rest of Europe. A country that has no power to control its borders has no power to control its destiny or the destiny of the people within it. So the issue for us today, as a nation of immigrants, is how to control our borders. How to reduce the porosity, plug up the leaks, identify who's supposed to be here and who's not. How to welcome the homeless, tempest-tossed, as the Statue of Liberty, the poem has it, who for hundreds of years now have made this country the America we love, the America we love has been made by the refugees who came here, by the immigrants. How do we assimilate the more than 12 million illegal immigrants who are now part of our infrastructure, part of our economy, part of our lives, on whom we depend in so many hidden ways? A friend of mine, who was head cook at Emanuel Hospital here in Portland, remembers what happened when Del Monte Fresh Foods was raided by the INS, the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service. Many, if not most, of Del Monte's employees were taken away. Emanuel, like other Portland hospitals, supermarkets, major restaurants, and catering services, had to scramble like mad to fill in a suddenly gaping hole in its labor.
labor force. Emmanuel, like most of the places I just mentioned, subcontracts out its chopped fruit and vegetables to places like Del Monte. You think that Safeway and Fred Meyer chop all those nice fruit and vegetable pliers themselves? All those bagged salads we buy? Uh-huh. Because Emmanuel subcontracted with Del Monte, it created an emergency for the whole hospital with no warning. Hospital food services called in, frantically called in all its employees on an emergency basis. The whole staff worked long hours overtime, day after day, cutting fruit and chopping vegetables. Everybody was pushed to the max to try and compensate for the loss of those invisible migrants' services. The issue of immigration is not a new one, is it? To this or any other country on earth. Well, okay, you don't hear of many people wanting to immigrate to North Korea. The immigration issue goes all the way back through the Bible as well. In Exodus, we have an account of how a majority culture treated its immigrant population as a national policy. And now I believe we have the scripture going to be read. Good morning. I'm Bob Munger, your liturgist. And the scripture this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verses 8 to 14, in the New Revised Standard Version. Now, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on them and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all tasks that they imposed on them. So ends the reading of the word. May the Lord add his blessing. That, by the way, is the chapter leading up to the birth of Moses, whom God chose to liberate Israel from slavery in Egypt. The experience of slavery as resident aliens shaped and informed Israel as a people, sank into its soul. Over and over in the Bible, we hear these commandments. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt, Exodus 22, 20. You shall not oppress the stranger, for you know the soul of a stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, Exodus 23, 9. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19.34 You too must befriend the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 10.19 Almost every country at some point wrestles with how to accommodate or assimilate those who come later, whether to treat them as friend or foe or a mixture of both. Think of what we've done for the, the past four years to the young children of immigrants fleeing to this country for refuge and a better life. What did, have we done? Tearing them away from their families, crowding them into detention camps in large cages, traumatizing them for life. After all, if we take their children away, these immigrants will stop flooding our shores, right? 
wrong. More than wrong, it is evil. Desperate and driven by the rise of violence, poverty, and corruption in countries such as Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, more than 200,000 people were stopped at the border by Customs and Border Protection officials last month in July this year, up from 189,000 in June. Last Friday's USA Today puts it this way. Usually in the summer, the number of migrants drops way down because of the dangerous desert heat. But this summer, the hottest summer on record, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, this summer, the numbers have climbed to the highest point in 20 years. At a press briefing in Brownsville, Texas on Thursday, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas said, we're facing a serious challenge at our southern border and it's made more acute and more difficult because of the COVID-19 pandemic, now Delta. It's also been made more difficult because of the fact that the prior administration both slashed our international assistance to those countries, which helped the economy, which kept people home. And it both slashed our international assistance to those countries and it dismantled our uh, asylum system. So it both slashed the, the, the uh, we both slashed the assistance to these countries to help them survive, and then we dismantled our own asylum system and completely broke the whole thing. The life of an illegal immigrant here is a vulnerable. The practice of some growers is to hire undocumented workers to harvest crops and then, just as the work is finishing up, turn them over to the Border Patrol for deportation before they're paid. This is not an uncommon experience for migrant workers in border states like Arizona, Texas, or even California. Illegals are cheap and relatively safe to abuse by com companies or individuals hiring them because who are they going to complain to? Speak up and you'll get deported and lose your job. So workplace safety violations go unreported until enough people die or get seriously injured. You remember that farm worker who died in one of our local fields during the last heat wave six weeks ago? We, uh, it was in all the papers. He worked at a farm that has been repeatedly cited since 2014 for failing to provide water or toilets for workers in the fields and for failing to provide information about pesticides being used and for failing to provide even an eyewash station or contact information for emergency medical care if you were splashed or poisoned. Workers at this farm were in the fields throughout the heat wave. In Aloha, it was 115 degrees on my back deck. The man who died was found unresponsive, lying in the fields at the end of his shift. How long had he been lying there? I wonder. If you're a migrant worker, especially one without the proper documents, har harassment or abuse on the job is just something you have to put up with. Always hanging over your head is the threat that at any time your family may be broken up by deportation because some of you have papers and some of you don't. It's a fact of American history that every immigrant group who makes it here settles down and starts moving up the economic ladder, resists and resents the next one to set a foot on the run. The Pilgrims and the Puritans came seeking religious freedom here, but denied it to others. That's how Rhode Island was founded, if you remember. From the Irish fleeing the potato famine 
to the Chinese workers brought over to build the Intercontinental Railroad, to the Eastern Euro European Puerto Rican Japanese, and for the last 50 years, the immigrants from South Asia, India, Mexico, and Central America, all have faced the resistance and prejudice of those who've come here before. We are a nation of immigrants. Everybody here came from here from somewhere else. Even our Native Americans might better be called First Americans. The evidence, both archaeological and DNA, indicates that they came over the land bridge from Siberia during the last ice age about 25,000 years ago. It all comes down to people. And I'd like to tell you now about Hector. Hector is a gardener by profession. He has been working with and for our family for over 20 years. He's wise with growing things, wise in the ways of the earth. Hector is a patient man, patient with plants, patient with people. He has done for us almost everything outside you can do. Landscaping, lawn care, planting trees and bushes, caring for our grapevines, climbing 20 or 30 feet up trees that need major pruning in order to saw the big branches off, fertilizing, weeding, roof cleaning. His skin is weathered from living an outdoor life. Hector was born in Mexico and goes back to visit family when he can. Sometimes his family comes to help him mow or weed or trim. He has a son and a daughter in college. He is known in his community for all that great amount that he does to help others. And I have heard this from the people who, who come to help him. Um, when it's not his family, he brings other people. And uh, they talked about how much he does for his, the community. During the last heat wave, Hector came to mow the lawn when it was 115 degrees on my back deck. I said, Hector, go home. It's too hot to work, and the grass isn't going anywhere. And with some strenuous persuasion, he went. The next week, he came back to mow in the late afternoon, but it was still over 100 and too hot. I gave him a bottle of water and again said, go home. It was harder to let him, it was harder to get him to go, even though he knew it wouldn't affect his salary. And he insisted on doing some garden care before he left. This week he came when he was 97 and was working on the grapes. As usual, I came out with a bottle of water, pointed out that the grass wasn't growing anyway because of the heat, and urged him once again to take care of himself. Hector isn't young, and go home early. This time he dug in his heels and promised he would go when he had finished the grapes and finished mowing the front lawn. I realized that once again, we were bargaining in reverse. I was trying to get him to do less work and take care of his health, and he was pushing to do more work on this garden for which he feels responsible. It was one of those Kingdom of God moments. And this brings us back to where we are today. All of us immigrants on this good earth, all of us trying to live and survive and thrive. And the question for which there is no path or easy answer, but which we are all called on to answer as Christians is, how does God call me to think about this issue? The issue of immigration. Where does God call me to act? What would Jesus do? Where do I see the face of Christ? Amen.
few things to tell you about. Actually, quite a few things. We're kind of busy coming up. Um, first off, let me uh, thank all of you for your contributions, your continuing contributions, financial and physical and emotional, um, to this church. Uh, we won't be doing a physical offering as of passing the plate, but the uh, plate is in the back and we continue online offerings as well. Um, the Bazaar Craft Group is meeting this Thursday, the 19th at 10 in Wesley Hall. So um, you will need to wear masks still, and if you have any questions, you can call Sharon. Uh, she, will, she will give you all of the details. Um, the week of the 26th, this church is going to be hopping. Uh, we have a bunch of stuff going on. We have a COVID vaccine clinic. We have Wake Up Beaverton School Supply Drive, and we have the free food market, and I think we're going to need some help there. Uh, the vaccine clinic, uh, in partnership with OHA, the Oregon Health Authority, is, is the 26th from 1 to 6. Walk-ups and drive-ups are welcome. You don't have to sign up. So if you know anyone 12 and up that hasn't been vaccinated and is interested, please let them know that this is happening. Uh, we, we have a different team helping us do this clinic, so they're asking for volunteers to help with checking with registrations as well as set up and tear down. So let Jefferson, let Pastor Jefferson know um, if you can help with that. At the same time, we will be doing the free food market on that same Thursday, and the setup for that will begin at 12. Um, the distribution is at 2.30 to 4, I think it's 4.30. Let Sharon know if you can help with that. We will still need the help setting that up. It's, it's our normal food uh, giveaway or food uh, market. However, it, we've, we've combined it with, excuse me, with the COVID clinic and Wake Up Beaverton, which is our school supply drive. So we will also be giving out uh, packed backpacks that are filled with school supplies for kids who need them. Uh, we are still collecting monetary donations for that. You can send them to the church office. You can put them in the, the plate. Uh, just let us know um, if you can help with that. Also, we're going to be packing those backpacks on the 24th, on Tuesday, from 10 to 2. And Sharon is coordinating. Sharon, you are going to be so busy. I am, I'm just telling you. Um, we will also need people to help set up and tear that down as well. Now, in the midst of all of this, the church office is closed from the 17th to the 27th because Wendy's on vacation. So um, there may be a little delay in response if you leave a message on the church um, email or telephone. We will be checking them, and, and Jefferson, Pastor Jefferson, um, can also be reached if you need him in an emergency. So um, there's, there's a lot. This is a good thing that we're doing for the community and um, I'm excited for all this to be happening. Now, Joan, did you have an announcement this morning that you needed to come up and talk about? Or Sean, are you going to do it? <laughs> all right, I'm going to have Sean, who is our finance chair, come up. We have um, a few things that we need to let people know about. We have a few holes to fill. Good morning, everybody. Sean Faust, uh, a praise band member, uh, church finance uh, council chair. Um, so we've had uh, either had some uh, vacancies on church council or a, an upcoming vacancy that we need to fill. Uh, most importantly, um, uh, as Melanie mentioned, uh, she'll be stepping down uh, as SBRC chair soon. Uh, so we definitely need somebody um, uh, willing to step forward to take on that role uh, to work as a liaison between this congregation and our pastor. And, uh, it's, a, it's a big responsibility, but uh, I think it's, it'd be very rewarding. Um, on finance, um, we are in need of a finance secretary. Um, uh, Karen. Uh, can't handle all of the necessary responsibilities, and there are certain things that I'm, you know, as chair, not allowed to do. Uh, so we do need uh, somebody who would be willing to step forward and handle that. You can uh, talk to myself or, or Karen about um, about the role that's required. And lastly, um, you know, sadly, uh, 
Abby and her family have moved, and so we no longer have a hospitality chair. Uh, so uh, if anybody's interested in um, uh, filling that role, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I know that there doesn't seem to be a huge need for it, uh, but I think that uh, it's always uh, helpful to, to keep in mind that you know, we want to be hospitable whether we're here or remote. And uh, we want to you know, provide that hospitality to, um, to all in our congregation, anybody who, who uh, visits either online or, or in person. Um, uh, I think that would be uh, also a very rewarding goal. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, have a blessed time. benediction, go forth into the world trusting with your hearts the wisdom God bestows upon all who seek to follow God's will. When called to lead, do so with humility and confidence in God. Be in this world a sign of Jesus' presence. Share compassion with all whom you would encounter. Live wisely in God's name and glorify God in all that you do. And may the grace, mercy, and wisdom of God be our support, guidance, and strength from this day forward and forevermore in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.